Hello and welcome to a new drawing class. So this one I think is really going to help you improve your observational skills. It's a great exercise in seeing abstract forms instead of what your brain wants you to see. And that is one of the keys to successful drawing. We're going to be drawing uh, in reverse today, so we're going to be using a white pencil on a dark surface. And if you've never done this before, I really do want to encourage you to follow along because well, it's challenging in a good way, but it's also a nice change of pace. Now the subject is this figure study, so really dramatic low-key lighting here to give what's called a chiaroscuro effect, so an effect that was very famously used by the likes of Rembrandt and Caravaggio. Now admittedly, this isn't the most difficult figure study in the world, but I'd like you to draw this purely through observational techniques. So no grids, no rulers, uh, no proportional dividers, and definitely no tracing. I'll be watching you for that one. The technique that I'm going to use predominantly for this is one that I covered in the Drawing Essentials course called Enveloping. So I'll also be using things like basic shapes and negative space uh, to create something that is hopefully reasonably well proportioned. Now in terms of the materials, the list is very, very short, uh, but I do just want to take you through a few different options, so let's go ahead and do that now. So when I came into the studio this morning, I had a look around for any dark coloured paper that we had lying around. And I came across a few different colours. So we've got this dark grey one here, there's a dark blue, a dark tan colour, this black one as well. Some of these are more expensive pastel papers, these two are pastel papers. This is a really inexpensive uh, sugar paper. Now any of these will work for this exercise. It's not about making a piece of amazing art that's going to last a thousand years. This is a fun exercise that is purely to improve your observational awareness. So use whatever that you've got available to you, whatever's to hand. If you don't have anything to hand that's in a, a nice dark colour, then go and get some of the lower end pastel paper. On grey paper is a really low cost uh, pastel paper. Cancer Mitant is very reasonably priced as well. And you can get either a couple of loose sheets or you can go for a pad of a mixture of different colours. Obviously just make sure there's some dark ones in there. Places like Amazon, any of the major online art stores will have all of those available. Now I'm going to use this piece of black pastel paper. This one's by Claire Fontaine. It's not actually my most favourite surface in the world to work on because there's a little bit too much texture for my, uh, you know, my particular liking uh, and I don't like the look of that texture, but that's a personal preference thing. What this surface will do is it'll stop me from getting too fiddly and too precise. The amount of surface texture means that I've got to stay relatively loose and sketchy. So what am I going to draw with? Well, I've basically got two options. So there's a white colour pencil or a white pastel pencil. Both of these will work on any reasonably dark surface. So they'll certainly show up on a black surface or a dark blue surface. But even if I take this tan colour surface here, you'll be able to see that the pastel pencil shows up nice and brightly. So does the coloured pencil. So any of these surfaces, reasonably dark surfaces, will work with both. If you've got both available to you, or you've got neither available and you've got to go and get one, I would definitely go for the pastel pencil, simply because it's a little bit easier to erase than the coloured pencil. With the coloured pencil, you've got to use a more sturdy eraser. It just means you've got to put a little bit more pressure into the paper surface, and you might disturb some of that paper surface. So go for the pastel pencil if you've got both available to you. Now, other than that, all you really need is your sharpener, one of those two erasers, kneadable eraser if it's a pastel pencil is going to be fine, and that's basically it. So if you get those things together and get yourself set up, and then we'll make a start. Let's see how this technique called enveloping is actually put into practice and how it's going to help you to draw with more accurate proportion regardless of the size that you want to draw. Now it's not a new technique, it's one that you'll see referred to in many of the classic drawing books. A lot of life artists use this and essentially it involves creating a shape or an envelope around your subject. That envelope typically consists of no more than five or six different sides and you'll see as we draw this out in a moment what that actually means. What it does, the beauty of this technique, is that it takes what is essentially a really complicated shape and it breaks it down into a basic shape. So going back to that idea of breaking things down into basic shapes, into general shapes, they are much easier to see and to judge proportionally than a really complicated shape like a figure with all of its undulations and contours. Now the best way to really understand this is first of all to see it and then to have a go. So let's dive straight in and you can see this process as it unfolds. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to look for an edge, a straight edge that I can create somewhere on the subject. 
And the one that jumps out to me on this particular subject is this point here. So I can quite easily create a line across the two points of the elbow, a straight line that meet those two points. And that straight line is gonna have an angle to it. So you can see if I lay my pencil over there, it's slightly off the vertical. So there's vertical. And the point across the two elbows there has an angle to it. So what I can do is replicate that angle on my paper. It doesn't matter how big I make the line. In fact, I want to overextend that line. The most important thing is that I try and get the angle as accurately as possible. You don't need to be deadly accurate. You know, we're not talking about using a protractor here and measuring with a compass, but we want to get it reasonably accurate. And the best way to do that is to lay your pencil down, get a feel for what that angle is, and then make your best guess. Okay, once you've got something down on paper, it's much easier to then check that than it is to try and obsess over getting it right first time. Get something down on paper, check it, and if necessary, use your eraser and adjust. So I'm happy with that. It's probably not an exact angle, but it's certainly good enough. Now from here, I want to look then at the next side of the shape, one that touches this angle. So I can draw a line from this point of the elbow that runs across the top of the head. And again, that will have an angle to it. So I can get a feel for that angle with the pencil, and then I can lay the pencil down if I want to, just to help strengthen that feel. And then I'm gonna put that line in as best I can. Again, not worried about the length of the line, I want to overextend it because it gives me a little bit more to play with in a moment. So I've got that line down, let's just do a double check. So again, I think that's pretty close, close enough for me. Now one thing that I should have mentioned is that it really doesn't matter where this line is placed in relation to this one. As long as this angle is correct and this angle is correct, that's all that matters. So if I'd have placed the line slightly further down here or down here, it doesn't matter. I've placed it here just because it's roughly, probably a little bit lower down, but it's roughly on line with where it is in the reference photo. Moving on with this process then, the next side of this big basic shape, this big envelope around the figure, the next side is gonna be one that incorporates the back of the head. So I've got an angle that is gonna be something approximate to that, if the pencil will stay still. So that's gonna run down the back of the head, incorporate the back of the hand as well. It's gonna hit some points and miss some points. Don't worry about that, you're just looking to get the best line that you can that touches as many different points as possible within your subject. So I've now gotta recreate that angle on my paper but it's at this stage I've got to think about where I put this line on my paper. Because what this third line will do, and it's always the case that it's the third line, what this third line is going to do is dictate the size of my drawing. It's not going to do anything about the proportion. You don't need to worry about proportions at this stage. You just need to think about the size of your drawing. And the only consideration is, will it fit on your piece of paper? So if I place this line here, I'm going to have a small drawing. If I place it up here, I'm going to have a large drawer and it's not going to fit on the paper. It's going to go off camera there. So I want to think about a place where I can reasonably fit my drawing on uh, within the paper, the size that I want it to be. So for the purposes of this demonstration, I'm going to keep it approximately the same size as the reference photograph. It won't be exact. That really doesn't matter. So I'm going to make the mark somewhere around about here. So let's take that angle and let's make the best mark that we can extend it, and then check. So I'm reasonably happy again with that. And by the way, don't worry if you have to erase each of these lines a couple of times, two or three times, before you're happy with them. With practice, as you work with this technique, you'll find that more of your lines go down accurately first time. You know, but to be honest, I would expect to have to erase a couple of these lines. Um, it's probably just pure fluke that I've got the first three down exactly as I want to. The important thing is that you're happy with these marks. If you don't get them right first time, it doesn't matter, it's to be expected. But if you don't get them right first time, please do take the time to erase them and adjust them because these initial marks lay the foundations for the success of your overall drawing. Okay, so our next line now is really important because it's this next one that is gonna determine your proportions. You're committing to proportions. So the next one I'm gonna look at is the angle for the arm here. 
I'm not going to be worried too much about this bottom half of the drawing because it's really, as a shape, it's really simple. I'll come on to that later, but you'll see why. So I just want to put this angle and I'm going to take it all the way through to the bottom of the picture plane and look at that angle there. Now, why is this one really important? Well, what it does is it sets the length of this line here, doesn't it? As soon as I lay this angle down, it's determined, dictated the length of this line. If I lay the angle down there, the length of this line is this long. So if I lay it down there, it's this long. If I put the line here, the length of this line is this long. Straight away what that's done then is it's created length on this line and length has already been created on this line. This has to be proportional to this. So just to demonstrate this point a little bit more clearly, get it really solidified in your mind, I'm going to bring in a ruler. Now I'm not using this for the drawing process, I just want to use this to demonstrate the point. So if I measure the length of this line here, so from the bottom of the elbow to the top of the elbow, it's approximately 8 centimetres, a little under 8 centimetres. If I measure the length of this line, that is approximately, well it's bang on, 11 centimetres. So 8 and 11 centimetres, this distance here as a proportion of this distance, 8 as a proportion of 11, is around about 3 quarters, it's around about 75%. So we know that the distance between, from here to here has to be around about 75% of this distance. And it doesn't matter what size drawing you make, if you want it to be to scale and in proportion, that ratio of 75% has to remain the same. If this doubles in size, and goes from 8 centimetres to 16, this has got to double in size from 11 to 22. So because I've already set the length of this line here, because I've put this angle in and this one, so that length is determined, it means that this length here has to be the co correct proportion relative to this one. This one has to be 75% of this one. Now what I could do is I could get a ruler and I could say, well, the length of this is 12 on mine, so it's slightly larger than the reference photograph. So three quarters of that is nine. So let's place the ruler down and make a mark at nine centimeters. But the point of this exercise is that you're not using rulers. You can't use a ruler on a life subject. You know, you can't go up to a life model and start using a tape measure to measure different angles and distances. And also using a ruler is a little bit mechanical. You know, we're not trying to design an airport. We're trying to do a drawing that has got some feel and flow to it. So what do you do? If you're not going to use a ruler, how do you make sure that this line here is in proportion to this one? And the same for all the other lines that we put in. Well, quite simply, you use another angle. So let me show you what I mean. If I take an angle from this point here that we've already set, and I take this angle up to this point here, I'm not going to draw that in on top of the reference photograph, but you'll be able to see what I mean just across there. So I look at the severity, the steepness of that angle there. If I take that and I place it on my point here, this point here, so let's just double check that angle, and then I'm just going to try and ghost that in, because it's not going to be one that we keep. And I take that all the way down. Wherever it meets here, that is the length of the line that we need. So let's just check that the angle is correct. Okay, I think that's reasonably okay. And the beauty of this is, it doesn't matter how large your reference photograph is, how small the reference photograph is, same for your drawing. This angle, as with every other angle, is going to stay exactly the same. So if I bring in the iPad, we go all high tech for a moment. So we've got the photograph there, and you can see at this small size, the angle that I'm looking for is from this point of the elbow to the top of the head there, so roughly across doesn't matter how big I make the reference photograph, that angle is staying exactly the same. Okay, so using that angle, we found the length of this is roughly, is going to be roughly three quarters the length of that. And let's just double check that to make sure I'm not too far out. So in centimetres, that is 12. So this one hopefully should be 9. And it's 8.75. So I'm more than happy with that for a sketch like this. I can make adjustments as I'm going along. It's given me a great foundation. 
So where do we go from here? Well, we said about this line here for the, the angle across the bottom of the upper arm there. So I know where I, I'm gonna be able to put it on this line now. So I just gotta check the angle of that. So just drawing that one in. And again, I'm gonna extend it all the way down to the bottom. Let's just double check that angle. Okay, mine probably needs to be a little bit flatter than what I've done it. So I'm gonna just try and draw that in ever so slightly flatter. There we go. And just erase the first one. Just make a check. So it's well worth doing these checks at this early stage because it's easy to make amendments before you've committed to drawing in all nice fine detail. So far then we've got one, two, three, four sides of the shape in. Only need one more to fill it in. You know, sometimes you might want to do six sides, but the key is that you don't do more than that. Otherwise the shape is becoming too complicated. Now the thing about this reference photograph is that to the right hand side it's all so dark that there really isn't anything to draw in. But for the purposes of the demonstration, in case you've got other subjects, you know, where it's not going to be like this, let's just put that angle in. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to imagine that the hand finishes roughly around about here. It's just on the edge of a ponytail. And I'm going to draw a line in that touches the ponytail. It's slightly off the angle. Again, I'm going to draw that into the bottom there. But again, I need to know where this point is going to be. So what I can do is draw a line from this point to here an imaginary line, I'm not going to draw that on the reference, but I can see the angle of that, the bottom of the forearm there. So I can ghost in that line there. Let's just double check that. That's roughly about right. So just taking that up, it's going to be somewhere here. Make one more check. That's okay, I'm happy with that. So this final line then, really I don't need to put in, but if I was, I'd run it along just the edges of the ponytail that I can see. So it's slightly off the vertical. So we can put that in slightly off the vertical. I really don't need to worry about the accuracy of this one, as I say, because all of that side of the shape gets lost. So what I've got now, if I erase these two temporary lines that we use just to find the, the markings, to find the lengths of these two sides and mark those off. Let's just get rid of this bit and this bit up here this bit here. So what I've got now is a very abstract, peculiar shape, but proportionally it's going to really help me with the width, the overall width comparative to the height, the size of the forearms there and the elbows comparative to everything else. That's all there is to it and it might look like you, you, know, you haven't got a lot to work with, but you really have. We're going to take this on now using other techniques like basic shapes and negative space. The only other thing that I think is going to help you, particularly if you struggle with your drawing skills, I think is a good idea for you to put in, and that's a centre line. I say centre line, what I'm actually going to do is just draw a line from this point here. It really doesn't matter where you draw this centre line, all it's going to do is just split the shape in two. It just gives you a few more reference points, which I'll come on to, uh, that are easier to compare to one another. So I'm just going to put this centre line in, for now, or this line that runs from this, the middle of this point here, and you'll see how I work with that in a moment. Now, by the way, what I have done is included this reference photograph with some enveloping lines already printed on there for you. So you can just uh, pull it up on your iPad if you don't want to print it out and draw them on. What I would say is that if you're not entirely confident with your drawing skills, work initially from that photograph with the lines on top of the drawing. But just do a basic outline drawing and then move that to one side and then do your proper drawing where you render it and you add in your shading. Do that by trying to see these lines with your mind's eye. So you're just laying them down with the pencil, getting a feel for them, because that's what's going to help you then transfer this skill to life drawing, to any other kind of drawing, any type of subject matter. So moving on, we're going to look at reference points, basic shapes and negative space to complete this drawing. So all I mean by reference points, well, the best way to describe it is to give you an example. So I want to look at where this lady's forehead, so that's going to be essentially the width of her head, where does it break this line, the length of this line? It's not in the middle, so halfway in between these two points, halfway between these two, would be here. The line actually breaks, it's a little over a third of the way through this line, I would say. So it's going to be somewhere in the region of about here. So that is all I mean by a reference point. I'm comparing one point to another. 
I can also do the same thing for the length of a head. So I can just about see a chin here. If I couldn't see any, I just make a, a best guess. So it's gonna be somewhere around here. It's just slightly above this point that we've put in here. So somewhere around here. Okay, so uh, height, of the, height of the head is gonna be somewhere in that region. With those two points in place, all I'm gonna do is look at putting in a very, very basic shape for the head. So I can look at doing an oval for the back of the head and then an oval for this part of the head here. Very, very basic shapes. The side of the head there, an oval representing that and then an oval representing that part of the head as well. It's just complete the oval, just so you can see what I mean by that. Okay, so very loose, quite scruffy, but we'll neaten that up as we go along. Now with each mark that you put in, every subsequent one becomes that much easier because you've got more reference points to go from. So one of the things that I can look, start looking at now is negative space. So look at this nice piece of negative space. I'm just gonna hatch that in so you can see what I'm referring to. It's created by the forearm, the forehead, and the enveloping side that we've put in there. So I'm gonna look at that negative space. So I'm looking at this abstract shape. So that abstract shape there to create the top edge of the forearm. You can just draw an angle down for the bottom of the forearm and I've got another nice piece of negative space here. So let's see if we can put that one in. So if you want to, you can measure the angle, but really it's a really simple shape. So you should be able to put that in with relative ease. So I'm just looking at the size and the shape of that triangle. It's quite a, um, it's almost like an equilateral triangle. Same size on each side shape. And then bottom of the elbow there. So let's carry on with this forearm. It's a really important part of the, of the pose of the composition. So I wanna make sure that I get the proportions of that correct. So I can pick a point and I'm gonna pick this one here, just where the, the fold in the forearm occurs. And I can take a plumb line, so just a straight line, up into this line here. Okay, so if I break that line, it's roughly around a third of this length. So this length here, a third of the way down, a plumb line is where this break occurs. So that's another reference point. So if I say one, two, break that shape into three, about there, bringing it down, somewhere in that region is where the break is gonna occur. Well, not somewhere in that region, but you know, very close to that region. So I can then, with a bit more confidence, just put this basic shape. I'm not worried about contours yet. Let's get this in here. I'm just trying to eyeball the width of the wrist. So the break is there. And now look at this piece of negative space here. See that as an abstract shape. So don't worry about contours of um, the, the clothing at this stage. Just look at that as a triangle and try to get the height and the width of that shape reasonably correct. So the hair comes, this is a little bit longer, hair comes around here. Okay, the hand is an important shape. So what if we take the angle of the wrist there? You can see that if I lay the pencil down, it just coincidentally happens to go to this point here. And you'll find lots of those. The more you look for reference points, the more you'll find these happy coincidences. So I'm gonna get an angle from there, an angle down, the break point of the wrist, it's gonna be somewhere there. Not worried about drawing in a, a, you know, a, a nicely contoured hand. All I'm doing is putting this in as a blocky, basic shape. So just looking at the angles. Hair comes in here. So with each mark that I put down, every subsequent one becomes that much easier. It's like doing a jigsaw. Each piece that you put down, the subsequent ones become that much easier. Okay, let's just put this sleeve in just because it helps to give me a bit more context. So drawing a plumb line down from the edge of a forehead is where this sleeve appears here. So that's another example of a reference point. Let me just put that in as a simple shape. These bits are relatively easy. So the bit that I said I wasn't worried about putting any kind of enveloping line in because it's just a simple shape to put in. We don't need to worry about proportion or anything like that. So 
So when you get to a point where you feel it's looking a little bit too scruffy to the point where you're struggling to see which marks you've put down, you can start erasing. Let's get rid of some of those uh, hatching marks I put in. So for the head, I'm happy that that was a reasonable, reasonable size and position. So I can put that in more neatly now. Let's get rid of the mark through the forearm there. Get rid of these marks within here. And get rid of this center line. So I didn't really use that center line, but that's okay. You know, it can help you to see the width of one side of the head to the other head for it, to the other side, for example. So now what I want to do is just keep in those basic shapes, these abstract negative shapes in mind. I want to start drawing in the head a little bit more accurately. So just looking at the break point there, we've got the nose that comes down, the angle of the nose. and the hair comes across. So now I'm looking at this as a shape. I'm not worried about eyes, I'm not worried about the nose, eyelashes, anything like that. I'm looking at this as one shape. So where does the hair break into the arm? Where's the reference point for that? Well, it's just before the break in the wrist there. So this shape now, how does this shape compare to this shape? It's not far off, it's not too far off, maybe needs to come a little bit further down like this. So this is more of a point here. So maybe commit to the shape of the forearm a bit more now. Okay, top of the head, let's look at there. So just looking at the shape of the hair. You put any major forms within the hair, so the major strands and locks. Not individual hairs. I'm just looking at these big pieces here. Okay, that'll do. That's all I need to put in for that. And then the chin. This is obviously an important shape. So I'm just looking at how... The reason this is quite an easy figure study is because a lot of the face is um, obscured. But, you know, you've still got to be careful with your proportions, otherwise it is going to look, uh, it's not going to look right at all. So when you've got all of these basic shapes, the basic outline in, take a step back and just compare your drawing to your reference photograph, looking at those big basic shapes. So one that I need to adjust is the hand there. I need to make that a little bit larger. I think that's a bit too small. This shape here isn't quite right. I'm just going to make that a little bit deeper. So I'm going to spend just a minute or so just making that adjustment. I'm also going to erase these lines here and any of the lines that I don't need and that are quite heavy. So what I'll do with the kneadable eraser is just go over the whole thing just so that it's quite light, just picking out any of the points that are really, really heavy uh, pastel pencil. And it'll leave me with a light line in that I can then work with when we go on to the rendering process. I've tidied up the drawing, erased those extraneous marks, slightly increased the size of this hand, slightly adjusted the shape here, but really I didn't feel that I needed to make too many adjustments at all. And that's a testament to the power of this enveloping technique. It's a great method for seeing your proportions more accurately, particularly with figure studies. So now the rendering process, the shading process, is going to be a lot quicker. There are still some key observations, key things to think about because we're working in reverse, a white pencil on a black background. And you probably know what's coming next if you've seen any of my lessons. The thing that I'm going to be looking for more than anything else, in fact, the only thing I'm going to be looking for is value. So the lights and the darks. Where are the lightest lights on this study? The forehead, the bridge of the nose, some in the hair there. The darkest darks, where are they? Obviously towards the right-hand side of the subject. How do those values, the lights and the darks, compare to one another? That's all I'm going to be looking at. When I lay down the value of this forearm, how does it compare to the head? It's not as light as the head. How does the head compare to you know, the lights in the hair? That's probably even lighter there. How does the dark of the forearm here compare to the dark of this part of the neck? All of these comparisons I'm looking at are purely to see how light and how dark each area is. Now obviously the lighter I want an area, the more pressure I'm going to use, the more paper surface that I want to cover. The darker the area, 
then the less paper surface that I'm going to cover, obviously, I'm going to use less pressure and allow more of that black paper surface to show through. So I'm going to work from top left hand corner, working from top to bottom and towards the bottom right hand corner, and that's purely just to keep a minimum of pastel from smudging with my hand. Okay, so let's get this in and let's keep the marks quite quick, quite loose. So just looking for the brightest part of this forearm. So the shadow area in here is obviously a dark, so I've got to release the pressure as I get round here. And I want to create that thin black line that is where it's in complete shadow. And it's obviously a lot lighter around this side. You can see the texture of the pastel paper showing through there. So it's going to be really difficult to get this really neat, which is a good thing from my point of view because that's the one thing that I probably battle with more than anything else is avoiding being too neat and too careful. They're really bright around this edge here. Okay, and then the forehead, so just reaffirming this line. So this is again really bright, so as much pressure as I can get away with without breaking the pencil. So I know that I can go all the way down the bridge of the nose and almost outline this, because that is a nice bright white there. So as much pressure as I can use here with the pastel pencil. So I'm going to be careful when I get around the area that I think the eyebrow is going to be. Okay, now for these facial features, nice sharp pencil. So with the pastel pencil, I'm using a sanding block to get that nice sharp point. I find that less frustrating than the, uh, a pencil sharpener. So I'm going to get a nice sharp point on this, and then we'll put in the eye and the eyebrow. Okay, so I'm coming in with a nice sharp point then. So we talked about reference points before. Let's just have a look at the reference point. Where does this eyebrow break into the brow? How does it relate to the arm? If I was to draw a line across here, what kind of shape would it make with this? So I know that if I take a line across here, the eyebrow is gonna be somewhere in this region, but I don't wanna put it in with white, do I? Because obviously we've gotta draw it negatively. So just below where I think the eyebrow is, I'm gonna look at this shape here. So it's this shape that creates the bottom of the eyebrow. So let's just make a mark. And I'm looking at how that's a sort of a triangular shape. I'm not going to go in with too much pressure because I don't know whether there are some shadow tones within that that I need to uh, reserve. And then the outer edge of the eyebrow, I'm just going to define. So I'm just looking at this area here. the bridge of the nose, so there's some shadow just inside the eye there. So all it means is that for now, I just put this in, in a, uh, with less pressure, so it's effectively a darker value, darker tone. And then we've got the eyebrow, so I've probably gone a little bit too much there, not to worry, we can just take that back with the eraser. So with this shape in here, this shape here, I can now look at the eyelid shape. So just looking the distance between the bridge of the nose, so where it breaks the nose there, that angle breaks. So look at that distance there. Let's just try and get that approximately. And this is, the eyelid is just a simple triangle shape. So I'm just trying to keep a little gap between those two shapes. That just helps to separate them. I might need to tone that. Uh, that complete black of the, the paper between the two. But for now, leaving that shape helps me distinguish the two. And then obviously we've got the eyelashes in there. So to create the eyelashes, all I'm gonna do is just put some white tone just around where the bottom of the eyelashes finish. And then I can take this all the way through here, just lightening the pressure because look how dark it is here. So we've got the eyebrow there now that we can put in the top of the eyebrow. So 
is going to be really light, which I'll use some more pressure in a moment. Okay, the bottom of the eyebrow goes round and then all of this here is in what is going to be a lighter value there. So just reserving that black. If you don't feel it or if you feel that you uh, have not reserved enough, just get the point of your kneadable eraser and you can just dab out a little bit. You're not going to be able to do this if you are using coloured pencils, but the advantage that you do have with coloured pencils is that you've got a a sharper point for longer, so you should be able to be able, you should be able to draw a little bit more accurately in the first place. Okay, and then it's just a case of refining those values. So all the way up to the top of the eyebrow, all this area here is a nice bright white, all the way up to the top of that. And then around this area here, it starts to go a little bit darker. So I can release the pressure. And there's a definite shadow area here. So lighter the pressure there, lighter around here. Nice and light under the eye there, right up onto the bottom of the eyelash. And then look at this area here, you've got some shadow which is really important. So I can just take the bridge of the nose, just soften that out slightly, releasing the pressure though, just to create this shadow area here. Get a bit lighter on the, on the eyelid there. And this shape in here is a little bit lighter as well. So let's just increase the pressure in there. Okay, and then the eyebrow itself, it's not jet black. The whole thing isn't jet black, is it? So I'm just gonna take the slightest of pressure just over the top, just refine the back part of that. Just to mute that slightly. And then let's just get some of the brights of the, of the hair in as well. So these are really light, aren't they? Look at how this, these light strands go all the way into the hand. I've got this nice contrast here with this bright light against the, uh, the slightly shadowed edge of the face. So obviously not looking to get every hair strand in, but far from it. Just looking at the major groupings of her major strands of her. So this part here, using lots of pressure here and then just lifting off. So lots of pressure lifting off because look at that area there as it goes into the hand is a, a darker value. So lifting off. darker areas within there. So if you just defocus your eyes and look for masses of light, masses of tone, masses of light and dark, you'll see that around here, this area you've got the bulk of them and there's very few dark. So there isn't a value that dark in that area. There's maybe a little one here, but the rest of the area I just want to tone down. And then as you get into this, these portions of hair here, now there are some darks, darker darks. So really lifting off here. So now that I've got the face in, let's just have a look at this forearm again, because now you can see whether or not this is too light or too dark. So I think this could do with lightening up uh, ever so slightly, just so there's less of a difference between the head and the arm. We want there to be some distinction and some contrast, even if there wasn't in the photograph, just because it helps to separate the shapes. But I think it can be a little bit more subtle than what I've got it at the moment. Okay, so I think next I'm gonna tackle the hand and this part of the forearm. 
I think they're really important parts of the composition. So we want to get those right. So I'm just looking for the lightest parts of the hand. You might want to sharpen your pencil if you're using a pastel pencil at this stage. Uh, but, you know, if we're keeping it relatively loose then, it doesn't matter too much. So first of all, let's just get the overall value just of the hand, just to block it in. And then it's a bit easier then to pick out these lighter portions. Just a hint of some reflected light looks like under here. And then just carrying it on, let's get some of these nice lights in here. So these are quite strong lights. This really nice shape. So just lifting off around here. So I think it's important to create this area of dark just in there because what it does is it creates this sense of a shadow. This sense of shadow between where the hand's grabbing the hair and then it's coming out. And I think that's going to really help just to describe that area of the drawing, just keeping that, reserving that area there. In fact, just with the plastic eraser, I want to get rid of all of that. And then there's just a hint of the light just catching the under underneath of the forearm there. Okay, so starting to get a bit lighter in the forearm here. This is really a great exercise for helping you to see and compare values. When you've got that skill, it will improve every form of art that you make, whether that's with uh, charcoal pencils, pastel pencils, graphite pencils, watercolors, oils, doesn't matter what the medium is, Understanding and being able to see those values and compare them is one of the most fundamental skills in all of fine art. So look how bright this is. This is the brightest bright in, in the entire composition. So I'm just going to look at this shape here. I need to reserve that. So this little crescent shape here, put that in and that creates this side and then just put some lights in around here so I'm just going to try and create a sense of curvature with the bottom of the arm there just by pressure and lifting off pressure lifting off and then just soften that edge and there's a little bit of light just within that soften that edge there nice strong light here just for the edge of the t-shirt so look how this disappears here and then let's just erase that one back so it comes in faintly and then you can start to apply more pressure until you get around here and it's as light as anything on the entire drawing We've got a little bit of light in here it's going to keep this nice and loose in this area We've got some nice bright whites on here. I'm not worried about the lettering, I can just give an impression, just break the shape up slightly. Okay, so I think moving back up into this area, I think this is an important part, obviously, of the face to get uh, correct. So I'm just looking at this light highlight here. That's the brightest part in that area, so I can put that in, maybe along with this area in here. So got this little nice negative shape we can look at. And then it darkens off here and this is what's going to create the shape of the jawline. So lighter pressure around here. Look at this shadow shape. So let's go the other side of the shadow shape. So this shadow shape here. So I want to go this side here. So I can define that by then putting the lights in it's on the front of the neck. So 
So just lifting the pressure off as I get round to this area. It really goes dark quite quickly. And this shape in here is lighter, isn't it? So I'm going to use quite a bit more pressure, maybe even more so than it's in the drawing, just because I think that's going to help it really stand out. Okay, and then a couple of nice white highlights here, just on the top edge. Very quickly fade into darkness. I've got this nice sharp crease here, this highlight here. It's all a bit lighter around here, but it's not too light, so really, really loose. So just around here, just a bit of a hit and miss line, just to describe this, the, uh, the seam in the t-shirt. And then there's another crease here, but again, lighter pressure because it's not in a lot of light. Just a little bit of tone, just to lay down there. So just the final refinements now, I'm just really filling in these areas where it's in its strongest light, making sure none of the paper is coming through. And then I'm going to take a step back and just glance over everything, make sure that I'm happy with the balance of those values. So I'm going to call it a day with this one. It's a quick sketch and its purpose is to help you strengthen your observational awareness. It's a nice change of pace as well to use a white pencil on a black piece of paper or a dark piece of paper, particularly because the paper surface is doing a lot of the work for you. you know, there's a lot of areas that you don't have to draw in, you don't have to render in, so it makes the whole process that much quicker. If you're not overly confident with your drawing skills, then use the reference photograph that's already got the envelope pre-printed on it, and then copy that, just look at the angles and copy it out, try and get your shape the same. If you're a bit more confident, then obviously try and do it by eye in the way that I've done it. If you're more confident again, what I've done is I've included lots of different black and white reference photographs with this low key lighting in the course materials. There's some really challenging ones in there and I would love to see them in the Art Tutor Galleries if you're brave enough to have a go. So until next time, enjoy this one and I'll see you again soon. All right, so I hope you enjoyed that lesson. Please do let me know in the comments below whether you've had a go with this or whether you plan to have a go with this and how you found it. Was it easy? Was it difficult? Anything that you found particularly challenging, it's always great to get your feedback. If you would like to join me on my premium drawing course, you'll find that over at drawawesome.com. It's where we take you through a program of weekly drawing projects, kind of builds you from whatever level you're at right now, even if that's a beginner, all the way through. The aim is to get you all the way through to a really accomplished, awesome artist. And we do that through regular weekly drawing projects. So if you're interested in that, head over to www.drawawesome.com and also maybe consider checking out artcooler.com as well. So Artcooler is our free community for leisure and hobby artists, artists of any ability, doesn't matter what standard you're at, even if you're a professional, you're welcome there as well. And it's just a place where you can share your artwork with other people on the same journey as you, you get to see their artwork, it's kind of helps to inspire you, give you some creative ideas. We've got monthly challenges there as well, and lots of free drawing lessons on there as well. There's a nice little app, again, completely free, that you can use on your iPhone, your iPad, or your Android phone or tablet, and it just makes it very, very simple to interact with the community and uh, kind of just surround yourself with like-minded people so when you get a chance go and have a look into that that's artcooler.com okay so thanks again for joining me on this lesson hit the subscribe button on the channel if you haven't already and uh, you're going to get notified as soon as i upload a new art lesson hopefully it won't be too long uh, but until then until next time take care and enjoy your art